Good evening, everyone. I'm Bill Doley, uh, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest uh, here in Tucson, Arizona, where we practice our uh, preservation archaeology mission. And I want to start by acknowledging that these are the traditional lands of the Tana Atum. And wherever you are tonight across the nation, um, take a moment and reflect on the meaning of being on uh, the traditional lands of, of uh, our native peoples of this nation. And a big thank you um, this evening. Uh, this is an, a, a series, this avian archaeology series is uh, sponsored by the uh, Smith family. And we want to say to Jean and Eldon and Jay, uh, we wish you all the best of health, and uh, thank you very much for making this possible tonight. And so tonight's speaker, Sean Dolan, um, like last month's speaker, uh, Sean actually is employed and uh, spends his days at the Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory, where he works with a firm called, and I'm glad that he explained this to me, uh, the firm's name is, is N3B Los Alamos. And so they're a contractor. And so he does his cultural resource management work there for Los Alamos uh, through this firm. And Sean earned his doctorate in 2016 from the University of Oklahoma. Um, while he's done a lot with Obsidian, um, we've I imagine he'll get that word in the tonight's talk somewhere, um, but we're asking him to share with us um, his interest and, and re recent work with uh, turkeys in the Mimbris Valley. So Sean, um, thank you so much. And we'll turn the screen over to you and uh, we'll get back uh, towards the end for some questions and some interesting answers. Thanks again. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Bill. Thanks, thanks, Linda, for having me. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Can you guys see that? All right. So, uh, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean Dolan. Um, thanks for uh, checking this uh, Archaeology Southwest um, presentation tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about a research project that I started back in uh, late 2017. Um, and so I'm just getting uh, finalizing uh, things with this research project. Um, so it's a this is a great time uh, for me to talk to you about this. Um, so let me let me get started. All right. So right off the bat, what I like to do in my presentations is is first off, um, kind of what are expectations. Um, so this slide is you know what you'll hopefully learn tonight. Um, so this talk, um, this series of, of talks uh, by several archaeologists in the, over the next um, months for Archaeology Southwest is all about avian archaeology. And so uh, tonight I'm going to be talking to you about turkeys in the Mimbris Valley. And first, before I get into turkeys in the Mimbris Valley, um, I'm going to talk to you about how archaeologists study turkeys. Um, what are the methods we use? Why do we use certain methods? Um, to, to understand how people interacted with, managed, um, and domesticated turkeys in uh, the United States Southwest and Northwest Mexico. So the Southwest Northwest. So if you hear me say Southwest Northwest, you know what I'm talking about. Um, after that, uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, a research project that I'm finalizing now um, about new insights into the human turkey relationship in the Mimbris Valley of Southwestern New Mexico um, during the Mimbris Classic period. So we're talking specifically about 80, 1000 to 1130. And that's what archaeologists call the Classic period for the Mimbris Valley. And also, you'll, you'll see a lot of Mimbris pottery. Um, and I know a lot of people who, who watch um, the Archaeology Southwest YouTube page um, is really interested in, in Mimbris pottery, all things Mimbris. And, uh, you know, we like Mimbris because of their pottery. Um, so you'll see a lot of members pottery, mostly with turkeys on them, um, although I do have another couple couple vessels that don't have turkeys. Um, so let's let's get into it. Um, 
So first we're talking about turkey domestication. And so I wanna briefly go over how archeologists, how researchers in, in anthropology and archeology span have defined domestication over, over the past decade or so. And uh, this definition by Melinda Zeter is, is what I use. And so you'll see I have key, key words or key parts of this definition highlighted or bolded. Um, and those are, those are what I want you to focus on because we'll come back to those later on in the presentation. Um, but according to Melinda Zeter, animal and plant domestication is a sustained multi-generational mutualistic relationship in which humans assume some significant level of control over the reproduction and care of a plant animal in order to secure a more predictable supply of a resource of interest and by which the plant animal is able to increase its reproductive success over individuals not participating in this relationship thereby enhancing the fitness of both humans and target domesticates. And now I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk to you about this uh, in a couple of slides, but in the past decade or so, um, archeologists have been really interested in understanding how people in the past, especially here in the Southwest, but also in Mesoamerica and the Southeastern United States, how people interacted and managed turkeys. And I think partly, you know, there's an increase uh, in turkey studies, possibly because, you know, there are very few domesticated animals here in North America in, in the distant past. And as you can see in, in this, this image at the bottom, you know, the, there's very few domesticated animals in North America. You have the dog um, that people, Pueblo people used, but the dog was domesticated thousands, tens of thousands of years before the turkey. Um, and the turkey was domesticated here. Um, so that's why I think one of the way, reasons why we're so much so interested in turkeys nowadays is because we can, we can really understand turkeys better using analytical methods to understand um, domestication husbandry practices. So for millennia, people in the United States Southwest and in, in Northwest Mexico, the Southwest Northwest, wove the turkey into their economic and social uh, and ceremonial fabric. Um, for example, people uh, depicted turkeys on rock art and pottery. And for the pottery, we're gonna be talking a lot about that tonight. Um, they interred turkeys in unique ritual contexts and they use the feathers and bones for ritual paraphernalia, um, including tools and musical instruments. Um, and also uh, turkeys became a significant source of protein in some parts of the Southwest Northwest when large uh, mammal populations like deer populations decreased. But as you'll see, as we talk about later on tonight, um, this wasn't the case for the Members Valley during the classic period. So how do archeologists study turkeys? Um, there are many ways, um, but tonight we're gonna go over four. Um, first two, visual and osteometric analyses and scanning electron microscopy. And so I'm briefly, I'm just going to briefly touch upon these first two, um, but I'm gonna go a little more in depth and talk about more research into mitochondrial DNA analysis and isotope analysis. So first, so visual and osteometric analyses. So uh, archaeologists study turkeys in many ways, and we can look at the bones. You know, we excavate a site, we find turkey bones from that site, and uh, just by looking at it, um, you know, without a microscope, we can tell a lot about that individual turkey um, by just looking at it. Um, we can tell if the turkeys were male or female based on the size. We can also tell possibly if they were young or old um, and if the turkey suffered any injuries. Um, and so having this information, you know, provides a good understanding of how people in the past may have managed the turkeys. And here on the screen, um, here are four uh, recent um, studies uh, looking at turkeys here in the Southwest, but also in, in I think the other parts of the United States um, using these methods. So if you're interested in learning more about turkey domestication and husbandry by researchers who used visual and osteometric analyses, you should check out these studies. 
So the second one is scanning electron microscopy. Now, I'm not going to get into this. Um, you can uh, look at these articles. Um, but archaeologists, when they uncover turkey eggshells um, from archaeological sites, they can look at the eggshells under the scanning electron micros microscope and understand the turkey's biological development. And, and pr primarily if the turkey hatched earlier than um, normal, normal what a turkey would hatch at. Um, and so having this information also helps to understand how people in the past managed turkeys. Um, and if you're interested in more about this method on turkey eggshells, Dr. Seiler Conrad uh, gave the Archaeology Southwest um, talk last month. And so you can watch his presentation where he touches upon some of his uh, um, results about um, SEM analysis on turkey eggshells from Arroyo Hondo Pueblo here in New Mexico. So the other two methods that are relevant to this study that I'm going to be presenting to you tonight about is mitochondrial DNA analysis. That's, that's the one. Um, and so in 2010, uh, Camilla Speller and her colleagues published a study demonstrating that turkeys from archaeological sites in here in the Southwest Northwest belong to either the H1 or H2 haplogroup. And so I have at the bottom right hand uh, side of the screen is, is what a haplogroup is. And so uh, in general, a haplogroup is a term that refers to shared genetic ancestry. And when utilized in zooarchaeological studies, knowing the haplogroup can help differentiate populations based on geographic location or domestication events. And so uh, I am not a geneticist, um, so please don't, don't ask me uh, difficult questions when it comes to this. Um, that's why I work with the team of, of geneticists on this study um, to do these analyses. Um, but in general, um, turkeys recovered from archaeological sites here in the Southwest Northwest are haplogroup H1 or H2. And so the H1 haplogroup turkey is, is the most common we found in the archaeological record. Um, you know, it's, it's virtually absent, the H1 haplogroup is virtually absent from the local wild subspecies that we see today in today's populations, which is the Miriam's wild turkey. And this has led researchers to define turkeys of the H1 haplogroup as an extinct domesticated clade. Um, whereas haplogroup H2 turkeys belong to the local wild subspecies and they're infrequent in the archeological record. And this is important to, to keep in mind uh, when we talk about the Mimbrus turkeys. There are also haplogroup H3 turkeys, which have nothing to do with this study. Um, however, um, Camilla Speller and co her colleagues, um, as well as other Mesoamerican archeologists who have looked at turkeys, um, show that uh, turkeys in Mesoamerica are haplogroup H3, and they're very distinct and different from the genetically from the turkeys here in the Southwest Northwest. And so here are a couple of recent articles. If you're interested in more about mitochondrial DNA analysis of turkeys in Mesoamerica, the Southeastern United States, as well as, as here in the Southwest, if you're interested in, in learning more about those. So the next uh, method, uh, that we'll be talking to you about are, are carbon, stable carbon and nitrogen isotope analyses. And archaeologists use this method to investigate what the turkeys were eating. Um, you know, it, it infers the diet of ancient human and animal populations. And most plants here, here in New Mexico and in the Southwest uh, have a C3 isotopic signature. Except maize, corn, uh, which was the primary food staple of people during the Mimbrus Classic period, they have a uh, maize has a C4 signature. And you can see on this, on this graph, um, this uh, chart, where uh, this is from uh, the Bill Leip et al. American Antiquity 2016 study from, from about turkeys. And so you can see over, over on the left side, the turkeys, um, the modern turkeys that have a C3 diet, that were not eating maize, and the turkeys and the humans on the right side of the screen uh, were consuming a C4 diet. Um, they were consuming maize. So you can see by, by looking at 
the carbon nitrogen isotopes and the carbon uh, the stable carbon isotopes, you can infer whether they had C3 or C4 diets. And in this slide, I, I have a question. And uh, can diet be a proxy for a turkey's genetic lineage? And we'll talk about that a little later on tonight. And so before archaeologists here in the Southwest performed mitochondrial DNA analysis to determine whether the turkey was haplogroup H1 domestic or haplogroup H2 wild genetically, um, before they did those studies, they would use the, the isotope analysis to infer the diet. And a lot of those studies would, would, would come off and say, if the turkeys consumed a C3 diet, we probably think the turkeys were wild because that means the turkeys were not around human, uh, human Pueblo villages and they weren't around um, the, maize farm, the maize farms. However, if the turkeys consumed a C4 diet, that means they were domesticated because that must mean that the turkeys were around humans and the humans were feeding the turkeys the maize. Um, but we'll get into that later on in this talk. If, if you can actually just use one method to infer uh, the genetics or the diet. And what, what archaeologists have found with doing these carbon uh, nitrogen isotope studies is that most turkeys recovered from archaeological sites here in the Southwest Northwest, they consumed a C4 diet, just like humans. Um, and then their nitrogen uh, levels, the nitrogen isotopes help infer the amount of protein intake. And so we can, we can suggest uh, based on the nitrogen values that the turkeys were likely not eating uh, a lot of protein, bugs, invertebrates, stuff like that. But we'll also touch upon that um, because Mimbrus potters often depicted uh, turkeys eating uh, grubs and worms and centipedes. So they might have um, eaten in other, other forms of protein. So here are a couple, couple recent um, studies. Uh, researchers have used carbon nitrogen isotope analyses to uh, investigate um, what turkeys were eating uh, in the southeastern United States, as well as uh, Mesoamerica and here in the Southwest, if you're interested in reading more about those. So with this information, you know, archaeologists and researchers have made considerable advances in turkey studies over the past decade. You know, we've learned a lot through analytical methods, um, through the mitochondrial DNA analysis and isotope analysis of how people interacted and managed turkeys, but primarily from the northern southwest. So think Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde, southern Utah areas. However, not a lot of studies, not a lot of research has, has come out about turkeys from the Southern Southwest. And so that's what my talk is about tonight, um, specifically the Mimbrus Valley in Southwestern New Mexico. And so how can we measure variation in, in turkey domestication husbandry studies when turkeys in entire archeological regions haven't been studied? You know, how can we uh, infer you know, whether the Mimbrus uh, people in the Members Valley had different domestication and husbandry practices compared to people in the Mesa Verde region, for example. And so um, that's, that's what I've been doing for the past four years. Um, I started this project in late 2017, and uh, it's pretty much almost finished now. And so we're going to talk about Mimbrus right now. Um, and so I'm, I'm assuming that most viewers of these Archaeology Southwest Cafe Talks are familiar with uh, the people who lived in the Mimbrus Valley um, in, of southwestern New Mexico, near Silver City, uh, near Deming, New Mexico. Um, it's a lot different terrain, different environment than the northern southwest, for example. Um, but in general, um, people who lived in this region hunted and gathered uh, and farmed maize, beans, and squash. And their culture flourished during what archaeologists call the classic period, the Mimbrus classic period from approximately 1,000 to 1130. And most of you know, uh, people in this region uh, are known for their enigmatic black on white and polychrome pottery vessels. Um, two of them, two of the vessels you can see on the screen. Um, one has very uh, fine line geometric designs. 
Um, and the other has uh, naturalistic motifs, uh, including humans, animals, and anthropomorphic figures. And uh, the, anthropom uh, the naturalistic uh, pottery vessels were only made during the classic period. Um, also during this time, uh, the population grew. So we're talking roughly around uh, 6,000 people or so, give or take, in the whole Mimbris Valley during the classic period. Um, during this time, it, the interaction and trade networks shifted um, between North and South. And, and people incorporated more Mesoamerican-like iconography and objects into their material culture, uh, including the use of scarlet macaws. Um, and so I know Chris Schwartz uh, and his, his research team will be talking to you about scarlet macaws um, in the Casas Grandes region later on in this Archaeology Southwest Cafe uh, program. Um, but as you can see in this one membrous vessel, um, you can see a man and a woman uh, interacting with scarlet macaws. And so birds, birds play an important role in, in classic period member society. Also, uh, if you're interested in, in more about members archaeology, I highly recommend um, these three books, uh, the Archaeology Southwest magazine uh, that came out a couple years ago, um, New Perspectives on Members Archaeology that came out in 2018, and uh, Members Lives and Landscapes that came out in 2010, um, if you're interested in learning more about members archaeology. And you can always look at the Archaeology Southwest uh, Cafe YouTube page, um, because there are several talk recorded talks about members archaeology on their YouTube channel, if you're interested in more about members. So my talk tonight is about turkeys in the members valley. And uh, I'm a members archaeologist and talking with other members archaeologists, you know, I got the sense that there were not a lot of turkeys, turkey bones coming out of uh, member sites um, compared to the northern southwest. So there's a lot of turkeys in the Mesa Verde region, southern Utah, uh, Mesa, uh, Chaco Canyon area. There's a lot of turkeys in those areas, but not a lot in the Mimbrus Valley. And I, I think this quote from Cosgrove and Cosgrove, who excavated the Swartz site in the 1920s, I, I think it sums it up pretty well. So af after excavating Swartz, um, they write, with the exception of one bone fragment of the tarso metatarsus of a male bird, there is an entire absence of turkey bones, either in the form of artifacts or as refuse. This is difficult to explain. Um, we're, I'm not saying that there, there are no turkey bones in the Members Valley. That wouldn't be true because I wouldn't have been able to do my study. Um, but turkey bones in comparison to the Northern Southwest are relatively uncommon uh, in Southwestern New Mexico. So Elk Ridge. Elk Ridge is a very important uh, Members Classic Period site um, in, in the Members Valley. And it was excavated in the 1990s by human systems research. And it's also been recently excavated by uh, Barbara Roth and uh, UNLV in Las Vegas um, in 2015 to 2018. And these are a couple of photos from the more recent excavations at Elk Ridge. And um, Elk Ridge has a lot of turkeys compared to most other classic period member sites. And um, Carl Lomba, who is a um, co-author on, on, on this study, um, is with HSR and, and excavated uh, Elk Ridge in the 1990s. And so I got in touch, actually he got in touch with me and this is where obsidian comes into play. So I, I've published and done a lot of studies on obsidian stone tools uh, in the Mimbris Valley and, and other parts of the Southwest. And so Carl, Carl came to me and said, hey, Sean, you know, we have these uh, obsidian projectile points at Elk Ridge. Would you like to uh, study them? And I said, sure, that sounds great. Um, but it's not as interesting. You know, we know where the obsidian is coming from. Um, it's not going to tell us much about how people lived at Elk Ridge. However, what I am interested in studying at Elk Ridge are the turkeys because I know that turkey bones are relatively uncommon in the Members Valley, but Elk Ridge has a lot of turkeys. And so he said, sure, let's, let's study them, let's do the DNA, let's do the isotopes, and, and let's compare 
they'll bridge data with the other uh, member sites in the, in the region. So that's kind of how we got started on this project. And um, Elk Ridge, uh, we'll be talking about Elk Ridge later, later in this talk. So kind of with that background, um, tonight I'm gonna be going over five research questions. So number one, how are turkeys depicted on Mimbris pottery? Um, we all love Mimbris because of the pottery and you know they have some really cool, interesting turkeys on their pottery. So let's, let's dive into that. Number two, are Mimbris turkeys haplogroup H1 or H2? And what did they eat? Um, because turkeys haven't been studied in the Mimbris Valley, um, like other parts of the Southwest, we have to do some baseline analyses and, and ask some pretty simple questions before we can get into the more difficult questions um, to investigate, which we do. Um, and so how do the, the genetic and the diet data of the, of the Mimbris turkeys compare to other, other turkeys elsewhere in the Southwest? Uh, number four, what is the evidence for penning slash limiting turkey mobility? And we'll go over that. And finally, what can the human turkey relationship in the Mimbris Valley contribute to our understanding of the socioecological aspects of classic period member society? So think about, um, uh, maybe some of you know that at, during the end of the Mimbris classic period, uh, there was a dry period. Um, people had difficulty growing crops. They had to travel farther or use different uh, maize fields. Um, and also uh, large mammal populations were, were relatively uncommon. And so could the Mimbris people in, in the Mimbris Valley have turned to eating their turkeys um, during this, this hard time? And so we get into that. And so I answer those five questions using Mimbris pottery iconography. And I sampled turkey bones from five sites uh, for mitochondrial DNA and sable carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis. Um, so first, I, I just want to thank uh, all the people um, who've, who've been a part of this study. Um, I couldn't have done this study without them. Um, you know, first, I want to thank Archaeology Southwest, Kate Bishop and Chris Schwartz. Um, I want to thank uh, the grant and funding agencies that we received the money from to do this project as well as my co-authors, um, Andrew Osga, Carl Lombaugh, John Krigbaum, Aureli Manon, Chris Schwartz, Ann Stone, and Kelly Knudsen. Um, and I also have to thank all the people who, who loaned me turkey samples um, and I just had conversations with about turkeys, Karen Scholemeyer, Steve LeBlanc, Mike Cannon, they were great, um, staff at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, Robin Cordero, Jack Young, Tom Holcomb, Barbara Roth, Caitlin Witchlatch, and uh, Jeff Romney. Um, they've all contributed to this, this project. So before I get into this, I just wanna thank them. So first research question, how are turkeys depicted on Mimbris pottery? And throughout this presentation already, you've seen Mimbris pottery with the turkey vessels, including, including this turkey, really nice turkey vessel, which is, um, you can see it at the Arizona State Museum if you haven't already seen it. It's, it's there in Tucson. So I really like studying Mimbris archeology span um, because I, I think it's more dynamic than other parts of the Southwest. Um, and that's partly because of uh, the really high quality designs that Mimbris potters did um, over a thousand years ago. And so there's no better place to study Turkey iconography than the Mimbris Valley um, because Mimbris pottery is so unique due to the potter's attention to detail. Um, and as you can see in these three images, you know, potters depicted observable characteristics of several animal species. And researchers can use these images to identify animals to the genus or species level. Um, and that's what we did with the turkeys. Um, and so the turkey has three anatomical traits that we can identify on the member's pottery. First, the snood is, uh, is uh, right, right here um, on the image. So the snood is a fleshy protuberance on the turkey's forehead. Uh, second, the beard is a tuft of stiff bristly filaments 
projecting outward and downward of the bird's breast. Finally, the wattle is a large fleshy appendage that hangs from the neck. Um, and both uh, male and female turkeys have these uh, anatomical traits, although uh, female uh, you know, wattles and snoods are a little less prominent than the males. And so to better understand how people in the Mimbris Valley interacted or thought about turkeys, I use the online Mimbris Pottery Images Digital Database or MIMPID and other published resources um, to look for all the Mimbris bowls uh, that have images of birds that have the snood beard or wattle. Um, there are Mimbris vessels with birds that may be turkeys, but they don't have the snood beard or wattle. So I didn't include them in my study uh, since the snood beard or wattle uh, confirms that the, the image is a, is a turkey. And so in my study, I found 29 vessels, 29 vessels, 26 in MIMPID and three in other um, published uh, sources with, uh, with birds with the snood beard or wattle. Um, Turkeys are figured prominently on 17 of the vessels, uh, but they share space on the remaining 12 vessels with humans and animals like insects, uh, frogs, uh, and even a badger and a mountain lion. Um, so uh, image uh, bowl number one in this, in this slide is of a turkey. You can see the snood on its, on its uh, face, and that's uh, also a, a potential mountain lion. Um, image two, you can see the turkey with the beard and the snood, and um, I'm thinking that's a badger um, underneath it. You can also see turkeys in five and six, vessels five and six, eating invertebrates. So they're grubs or centipedes eating, eat, you know, the turkeys are eating those. So these are just six of the turkey vessels um, with uh, snood, beard, or, and or wattle. So um, even though we're gonna look at the nitrogen and carbon isotope analyses to look at what the turkeys ate, um, based on just looking at the pottery vessels, it seems that turkeys in the Members Valley were, were not just eating maize, which we'll see, uh, but they were eating uh, insects. And so when, when I started this study, and, and looking at these, uh, all the turkeys with the pottery vessels, I, I came across this vessel. So this is a vessel that uh, Jesse Walter Fuchs uh, described in the, in the 1920s, I believe, when he was uh, traveling uh, Southwest New Mexico. And this is one of the bowls that he, he illustrated. And it's actually uh, curated at the El Paso Museum of Archeology. span And I, I gave a similar talk about Mimbris turkeys to the El Paso Museum of Archaeology a couple of years ago. And Jeff Romney, who's the director there, advertised my talk using this vessel. And, and when I saw it, I, I, was, I was outstanding. I as Jeff, like, where is this? Like, where, where did you get this vessel? And he's like, it's in our museum. So it's, to me, it's, it's the answer. When I saw this vessel, I just, I, I loved it. Um, it's clearly uh, an image of a man. Um, and you can see the penis. It, he's wearing a feather in, in his hair. He's holding a maize stalk, a corn stalk. And up here on the Parito Plateau at, at Los Alamos, we have a lot of uh, maize um, uh, rock art uh, petroglyphs that look just like this corn stalk. And you can clearly see the, the turkey with the snood. So here's a man holding out a maize stock towards the turkey. And I, I just loved it. It's, this was great. So I really like this vessel. Um, so, you know, based on the iconography, I'm gonna go back. Uh, based on the iconography, uh, it seems that men in member society interacted most frequently with turkeys. Um, we have a, a couple vessels of uh, men with the turkeys. We don't have any images of women with turkeys in the Members Valley. Um, and so it's interesting, um, a couple researchers working in the Mesa Verde region, 
Um, they argue that uh, Mesa Verde women managed turkeys within the household. The women did it. So the women provided kitchen scraps to the turkeys before eventually killing and eating them. However, there is there's little evidence that people here in the Members Valley consumed, ate turkeys for protein. Um, and it seems that based on the members pottery iconography, men in member society interacted most frequently with turkeys. So conceivably, men in member society managed turkeys for their feathers, which we'll get into later, but women in the Mesa Verde region managed the turkeys for their feathers and their meat. Um, so that was interesting. Um, and also, scarlet macaws are another commonly depicted bird on members pottery. And researchers have argued that uh, members potters depicted women interacting with macaws more than men in member society. So it may have been that men were managing the turkeys and women were managing the scarlet macaws in member society. And so this is just speculative uh, based on the iconography, um, but it's something to consider. So research questions two and three. So are members uh, turkeys haplogroup H1 or H2? And what do they eat? And how do those, the genetic and diet data uh, compare to turkeys elsewhere? So for this part of the study, um, I analyzed uh, 31 turkeys from five sites. So as you can see in the map, we have 17 turkeys from Elk Ridge, three turkeys from the Lake Roberts site, seven from Maddox, two from, Old, two from Old Town, and two from Wheaton Smith. And um, my colleagues and I um, coordinated on the mitochondrial DNA analysis and stable isotope analysis. Um, and you can see some of the, the bones that we uh, sampled from, from some of the sites, including Maddox and Wheaton Smith. Um, so these, these five sites are located along the upper, middle, and, and lower Members River. Um, they have classic period context, and excavations revealed um, turkeys from classic period subsurface archaeological context. So we're going to go into the mitochondrial DNA results. So uh, of the 31 turkeys sampled, um, we got uh, results from 18. Unfortunately, um, 13 uh, turkeys we, we couldn't get the DNA from. It just happens um, due, to, due to poor preservation of the turkey bones. Um, but we got a lot of data from the Elk Ridge site. Um, no data from Elk Lake Roberts, uh, just one, one sample from Maddox, zero from Old Town, and both, both samples from Wheaton Smith. And what we found is that of the 18 turkeys that we got results from, 10 of the turkeys, all from Elk Ridge, are haplogroup H1, whereas eight are haplogroup H2. So we also have five haplogroup H2 turkeys, the, the wild, uh, from Elk Ridge, one from Maddox, and two from Wheaton Smith. Um, and so this is interesting that um, none of the, uh, we only got the haplogroup H1 domestic turkeys from Elk Ridge whereas the other sites, uh, Elk Ridge has uh, evidence of both uh, maternal genetic lineages. And we'll go over that later on. So remember, um, all of the DNA, mitochondrial DNA studies that have been conducted on turkeys from the Southwest, uh, the Brian Kemp study, Emily Jones and colleagues, uh, Bill Leip and colleagues, they've primarily, the Camilla Speller 2010 paper, um, their study primarily focused on the northern Southwest. And what they found, uh, for example, in the Camilla Speller uh, paper, approximately 85% of their samples belong to the half of group H1 sample, the, the, the turkeys, whereas approximately 15% of their turkeys are half of group H2. We're not seeing that, um, at least uh, based on these samples in the Members Valley. Um, so it's, a, it's very different from the Northern Southwest. So I can't get into uh, a lot of the detail in this, in this presentation, um, but later on in, in a, an article published study, I, I touch upon it. So that's the DNA results. 
the isotope results. So of the 31 turkeys we sampled from the five sites, we got results from 29. Um, so much better than the, the DNA. Um, all of the Elk Ridge, all the Lake Roberts, um, we couldn't get one Maddox and one Old Town in, in both samples from Wheat and Smith. And as you can see in this, this plot, um, we have three, three groups, um, you know, a C3, a mixed, and a C4 group. And we, we were able to determine whether the turkeys consume C3, C4, or mixed diets uh, using uh, other published studies from, from human isotope analyses and, and the turkey isotope analyses. And we use those studies as a baseline to, to see where the, the members turkeys were located. So the first and most common group include 79% of the turkey samples um, exhibit carbon values indicating they, they consumed a C4 diet. So they consumed maize. Um, a smaller sample, 14% uh, have values indicating a C3 diet. So they were not eating uh, maize. They didn't have access to it. Um, finally, the remaining two turkeys, one from Wheaton Smith, Wheaton Smith and one from Old Town, um, kind of have a mixed diet. So they kind of have values in between C3 and C4, but their carbon values are, are clo more closer to the C4 consumers than the C3 consumers. Um, so they, they kind of had a, a little different, maybe a more varied diet than the strictly C4 consuming turkeys. Um, then based on the nitrogen levels, uh, the nitrogen values, many of the members turkeys had little access to animal protein, but three turkeys from Elk Ridge and one from Maddox have higher nitrogen values than the others. And so these four turkeys uh, primarily consumed a C4 diet, maize, but they may have consumed a more invertebrates uh, than the other turkeys, similar to what members potters depicted on members pottery. So turkeys with genetic and dietary data from the members valley, and we have results, um, we have both the diet and the genetics for 18 turkeys. Um, and here's a, here's a plot that looks at the different uh, nitrogen carbon values for the haplogroup H1 and H2 turkeys. And we have 10 H1 turkeys who consumed a C4 diet, one H2 wild turkey consumed a C3 diet, six H2 turkeys consumed the C4 diet, and one H2 turkey consumed a mixed diet. And so rem remember earlier tonight, um, I touched upon, can you use, can you take genetic data uh, as a proxy for diet and diet as a proxy for the turkey genetics, the haplogroup, with only using the one method? Um, and you can't, based on this member study, as well as the Emily Jones and Bill Leip study. And, and they emphasize this, and I wanna emphasize this tonight, and that isotope data, turkey isotope data cannot be used as a proxy for turkeys, mitochondrial DNA genetic lineage, and DNA data cannot be used as a proxy for a turkey's diet. Because you'll see haplogroup H2 turkeys, before doing any DNA analysis, if they would, if the researchers only did uh, the isotope analysis uh, and not the DNA, they would see the turkey consumed a C4 diet. So they would assume because they had a C4 diet, it was a haplogroup H1 domestic turkey. That's not the case. We see a lot of haplogroup H2 turkeys consuming C4 diets. So um, that's something to consider um, when doing turkey studies in the future. Um, and here is a, a, a plot. Um, I plotted the 29 members turkeys to 269 other archeological turkeys from, from published, the published studies, 13 modern turkeys and uh, 58 uh, Southwest Northwest humans, ancient humans. And you can see um, the C4 members turkeys align with the, most of the other ancient turkeys and most of the other ancient humans. Um, whereas the C3 members turkeys align to the uh, C3 consuming turkeys. And uh, interestingly, um, 
uh, Thornton et al. recently uh, came out with a study a couple, maybe a month or two ago in American Antiquity, where she looked at the DNA and the diet of uh, pre-Hispanic turkeys from the Southeast. And so a lot of these blue dots are from uh, Southeast turkeys. Um, so that was a really interesting study. So with having that data from the pottery iconography, from the DNA and from the isotopes, from the diet, um, we can answer some additional questions, some higher level questions about how people interacted with turkeys from the Members Valley. So what is the evidence for penning slash limiting turkey mobility? And what can the human turkey relationship contribute to understanding of the socio-ecological aspects of classic period member society? So in 1965, um, an archaeologist, Gene Pinkley, who was working in, in uh, Mesa, uh, Mesa Verde in uh, the 60s, argued that, that people domesticated turkeys to maintain sanity, since turkeys are arrogant, cantankerous bullies. It's a great quote. Um, Penning stopped the turkeys from eating crops in a way to uh, protect and safely keep the birds to acquire their feathers and meat. So the construction of formal pens with wood, thatching, or adobe, or the use of abandoned rooms to confine the turkeys implies site planning and management. Uh, the people in these areas had large, large flocks or large raptors of turkeys, so they had to manage them in some way. Um, however, turkey pens are relatively uncommon in the archaeological record. Um, but some of the best examples are at Pindi Pueblo and Arroyo Hondo, both near here near in Santa Fe, and at Pakine in northern Chihuahua. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about uh, turkey pens um, in the Southwest Northwest, you know, Siler Conrad gave a, a, a talk last month about turkey pens. And uh, here his, his uh, recent uh, study that came out a couple months ago, if you're interested in more about turkey pens. Um, but we're going to talk about turkey pens here in the Members Valley. Um, so there's not a lot of evidence, archaeological evidence we have uh, for turkey pens here in at classic period sites. Um, you know, archaeologists haven't found definitive evidence. However, while not conclusive, um, some potential turkey pens may exist at Elk Ridge, Nan Ranch, and Old Town. Um, because they have small, small rooms or bin features that may have used to confine the birds. Um, however, by comparing the, the relative, uh, not a lot of turkeys compared to what people at Pindi Pueblo or Apaki may had, for example, maybe people in the Members Valley didn't need to uh, pen their turkeys in formal turkey pens, like Paki may or, or Royal Hondo, for example. So were pens actually necessary? Um, you know, we do have three lines of evidence, however, that the people at Elk Ridge, at least, limited turkey mobility to some degree. And the first line of evidence comes from the turkey dependence on, on maize. Um, they have high level carbon levels um, to, reply, to suggest restrictions on free ranging. And so if the turkeys were not penned, we might find higher nitrogen values because they would be eating other foods, more possibly with more protein. Um, but we don't find that. Um, the second line of evidence uh, for limiting turkey mobility at Elk Ridge comes from watering bowls on the floors of Elk Ridge rooms with turkeys. So in the 1990s, uh, the HSR excavations recovered uh, potential, you know, uh, broken pottery sherds uh, on the floors of, of the Elk Ridge rooms. And um, Langan Harris, archaeologist who, who analyzed some of the faunal remains at uh, Royal Hondo, um, they, they found uh, watering bowls, pottery sherds on, on the turkey pens. Uh, finally, the third line of evidence is we have turkeys with healed bone injuries at Elk Ridge. Um, and we wouldn't really find wild turkeys, you know, um, who just roamed wild. Um, with, with these healed bone injuries um, because they wouldn't have survived in the wild. Uh, but they did survive at Elk Ridge because um, there's good lines of evidence that people at Elk Ridge 
had the interest and knowledge of raising um, and managing turkeys. Um, so those are, those are three lines of evidence. Uh, finally, so by understanding the, the, the relationship between humans and turkeys, archeologists can reconstruct socio-ecological aspects of classic period member society as it relates to ancient food webs, farming practices, and potential food insecurities. Um, oops. So the relationship between humans and turkeys in the Members Valley likely started when uh, Members farmers manipulated their environment. So due to a, a growing classic period population, um, people needed uh, more maize fields. They needed to cut the trees for timber beams and fuel for fires. Most likely the, the wild turkeys came into the members farming villages um, for, for food and for, for shelter. And so that's potentially why we see more haplogroup H2 turkeys than haplogroup H1 turkeys in the members valley. Um, and so people needed to clear the forest to make additional space for agricultural fields. Um, and, and clearing the forest destroyed wild turkey habitat. So the turkeys came in closer. And uh, the, the end of the members classic period around 1130 um, is a topic of immense debate among Southwest archeologists. And so there was a dry period in the early, early decades of the 1100s in the members valley uh, that intersected with food shortages created by farming strategies, population levels and landscape use. And also during that time, the members lacked reliable access to animal protein, large mammal animal protein. Um, since the mammal population, the large mammal population, the deers, the artiodactyls were mostly depleted. Um, so could the membrous groups eat eaten their turkeys during times of need? Um, and so we don't see that. Um, so the turkey bones analyzed for this study and turkey bones recovered from other member sites really don't have a lot of signs of, of burning or cutting. Um, which would indicate that they were consumed for, or processed for human consumption. Um, and it seems that um, the turkeys were used more for feathers. They wanted, the, the members wanted the feathers and were not interested in eating turkeys. And that's a little different than elsewhere in the Southwest. Uh, so in the Mesa Verde region, people began eating their turkeys when their artiodactyl populations became reduced. So you see more, more people eating their turkeys there, but not in the Members Valley. And so that's, that's something really interesting. So here's a summary slide we're wrapping up. Um, based on this, this study that my co-authors and I have done, we now have a, have a better understanding of the human turkey relationship in the Members Valley than, than before. We didn't really know uh, much about turkeys. We didn't know what they ate. We didn't know their genetic lineage, um, but now we do. Uh, and now we have a good baseline understanding of that. Uh, and members archeology span is just so cool just because of the pottery. Um, you know, with the, with the pottery iconography on the turkeys, members potters depicted turkeys on pottery vessels. And, and it's a small sample size, but men are frequently shown with the turkeys. We have, more haplogroup H1 turkeys than H2 turkeys, but not by much. And most of the members turkeys consumed a C4 diet uh, with some very little had a C3 and a mixed diet. And Elk Ridge, the Elk Ridge site was a very important place in the members valley uh, for turkeys, for managing turkeys. And Elk Ridge may have been the place in this region uh, for turkeys to acquire turkey feather blankets, turkey feathers and robes. Um, and turkeys were kept for the feathers and not for food. And so finally, um, future research. You know, uh, Archaeology Southwest, their mission is about preservation archaeology. And there are a lot more turkey bones and turkey eggshells um, from sites already excavated. And these uh, turkey bones of the eggshells are curated in museum facilities right now. And so, uh, there's a lot to be learned about uh, turkeys um, through just studying um, already existing museum collections. Um, but we need to know a lot more about 
how people domesticated and managed turkeys from the southern U.S. Southwest in Northwest Mexico. Pakime, for example. Pakime, there's hundreds of turkeys. We need to know about the diet and uh, the genetics of, of the Pakime turkeys, for example. Um, and, and right now, turkeys from sites in southern New Mexico near the Mimbers Valley that date to after the Mimbers Classic period, roughly 1200 to 1450. Um, we're, we're currently analyzing them for the, the genetics and the diet data. And that study uh, will hopefully be finished um, early in 2022, and we'll work on those results. Um, so I want to thank you know all my co-authors. You know I want to thank Archaeology Southwest, Bill Dooley, Linda Pierce, our, uh, Kate Bishop, and Chris Schwartz, um, and all my co-authors and uh, the people who've helped me with this study. Um, so thanks a lot, guys. Um, that's it. Um. Thanks, Sean. That was great. Yep. I love hearing about turkeys. Makes me happy. <laughs> um, we have a time for a couple of questions. If you if you have a couple minutes or two yeah, sure. here, um, yeah. And actually, going to start off with just a really simple one. But um, we had a question early on. Could you could you just explain um, for folk who are really basic and members? Um, archaeology, why did the pottery pieces have holes in the middle of them? Yeah, that, that question gets asked a lot um, about members archaeology. And so uh, archaeology, members archaeologists will call those um, perforated holes or sometimes kill holes. And so those, those pottery vessels um, were probably associated with human burials, members burials. And there was a, a very um, important uh, ritual burial tradition in the Members Valley during the classic period when someone died, uh, a family member died, they would bury them under the floors of the Members Pueblo rooms and they would often place one of the pottery vessels. Sometimes it was a geometric design, sometimes it was a naturalistic design with a human or an animal and uh, they would place it over the uh, individual's uh, face and um, we'll punch a little hole through it. Um, we don't know uh, the meaning behind it. Uh, we'll probably never know. Uh, but some people have said that you know it um, taking putting the, the vessel over the skull um, and the hole uh, releases the spirit. So that's possibly. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another pottery question, um, but turkeys as well. Um, we had a viewers asking that a little bit more about how did you determine or how did they determine that those pottery sherds on the floors, you know, how, how do you argue that those are watering holes and not something else? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the, um, the Lang and Harris uh, d discussion about that uh, turkey pens from Arroyo Hondo Pueblo, they had actual turkey pens, formal turkey pens. Um, and they, they suggest um, mm. they found those. Uh, I don't know how big the sherds were, um, but that's, that's an interpretation. Um, possibly the, the members turkeys at Elk Ridge, um, they were placed in abandoned rooms um, at Elk Ridge and they, you know, turkeys drink once in the morning and then uh, another time in the day. And uh, they would just load the, the watering bowls. So we're not exactly sure, but it is one interpretation. Yeah, cool, great. Um, someone wanted to know if you, um, more about the Elk Ridge, the, 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 bro the, the healed fractures. Um, do you know what percentage of the turkey bones showed healed fractures and were they only on the legs or were they on yeah, other they, bones they, as well? They, uh, I believe, uh, so 17, um, so there was a, a study done in the early 2000s on 17 of the Elk Ridge turkeys and uh, the an, uh, analyst found um, healed bone fractures on the humerus and tibiotarsis on three of the Elk Ridge turkeys, three of the 17. Humorous. Um, that's the wings, right? Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so I, I don't I don't go into it here, but um, there are instances of of people uh, tethering turkeys uh, mm -hmm. with with ropes around the neck or maybe the the legs, and potentially uh, the tethering could have 
maybe cause those injuries. Um, not exactly sure. Right. Um, so there, there have been more um, turkeys excavated from Elk Ridge um, recently in the past couple of years from UNLV. And it would be interesting to see if, if those, those turkeys also had healed bone injuries. Neat. Might you know um, what area of North America has the earliest evidence of turkey domestication? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, uh, Natalie Monroe um, did uh, her thesis or dissertation on turkeys in I believe in the early 2000s or the 90s. Um, and she has a really nice uh, 2011 book chapter um, that kind of uh, goes over uh, a lot of the history about turkeys. Um, Emmanuel Breitberg also has a, a good 1988, I think, dissertation about that does uh, kind of a, a holistic look at, at turkeys. Um, I can say that we don't find a lot of evidence of turkeys at archaeological sites in the Southwest that date to the archaic period. Um, late archaic, we don't have a lot of evidence of, of people interacting or eating turkeys during the archaic period. Not saying that they, they weren't there, they were probably there, um, but just in the archaeological record, we don't see them starting until, um, you know, kind of basket maker two, basket maker three. I know uh, Bill Leip's American Antiquity article um, looks at kind of early turkey domestication in, in the southern Utah area. So that study talks about, you know, 8,600-ish, 700s. So that's a answer. No, thank you. No, appreciate it. Um, more technical question. <laughs> Are not Kino amp, amp C4 plants? Yes. So, so are... There, 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 are, there are some wild plants here mm -hmm. in New Mexico in the Southwest that have uh, C4 signatures. Um, but what uh, archaeologists who have looked at the isotope data on turkeys from the northern Southwest, other parts of New Mexico, they have concluded that uh, most likely that they were not eating um, those wild C4 plants, but most likely they were eating the same thing that the humans were eating, the, the, the maize, so. Hmm. Okay, okay. There have been, we'll, we'll wrap up here in a minute too, but there's been a couple of questions sort of all related around the ideas of turkey feathers again. Um, one question, a question about, you know, could the feathers have been being traded? And in which case, is there any way you could even figure that out? And if you're gonna harvest turkey feathers, um, do you have to slaughter your turkey or do you just pull them out? And yeah, that's a really good question. Going or? <laughs> yeah, so there's two questions in that and, and, and both are really interesting. Um, I'm gonna talk about the second question. So yeah, you can, you can pluck turkey feathers off of live birds. And, and that's what, you know, we, we think they, they did. Um, because if, if they were not eating the turkeys to, and they would have to kill, kill and eat the turkeys, they were keeping the turkeys for their feathers. And some of the turkeys are, are older individuals. Um, so um, there is a, uh, I'm forgetting his name. There's a 2016 um, Journal, of, uh, Journal of Archaeological Science Reports paper um, that looks at uh, bone pathologies on turkeys. And he, he talks about um, plucking, you can pluck turkey feathers uh, from, from live birds um, and you can do it in ways that don't harm the bird. So that was probably happening. Um, trading the feathers, you know, potentially, um, I think turkey feathers were very important, um, but maybe not as much as scarlet macaw feathers. And scarlet macaw feathers are much more uncommon and, and scarlet macaws in general are, are uncommon compared to turkeys. Turkeys are, you know, you, you see them today here in the Southwest. You don't see scarlet macaws. Um, so I think, yes, the, the turkey feathers were likely traded. We can't really tell that archeologically just because the turkey feathers don't preserve in most archeological cases. Um, they have, uh, Turkey feathers, turkey feather robes or blankets have been found in dry cave context, um, but those are pretty rare. Um, so if you do study, it would be interesting to study the, the turkey feathers uh, or robes 
from from those cave cave sites if you could do um, strontium or I oxygen isotope analyses um, to to maybe see if they came in non-local or local. I think that would be really interesting. But getting your hands and doing those destructive analyses on on some really important um, objects might not happen. So yeah, yeah. Well, Molly Toll just reminded us that um, next lecture, speaking of feathers, might be this might be a good place to wrap up for the day anyway. But next lecture, Bill Leip and Mary Mary um, Waiki. I can't. I'm not. I'm probably butchering her name, but um, they're going to be talking about turkey feathers and turkey feather blankets and all sorts of fun stuff. So we have a whole turkey um, theme here this fall and winter, but. Um, we probably should wrap up for the night. We do have a few more questions, but I will share the questions with um, with uh, Sean. And if there are any that um, he feels um, like he can follow up on um, with, you know, individually or more, we'll, we'll do that. But it is after seven, so we should probably wrap this puppy up for tonight. And I should ask Bill to come back and um, give us a brief um, talk about the next thing and I have to figure out how to show you this. I probably not may not be able to show you what I want to show you, but that's okay. <laughs> well, let's just make it real quick here. Um, the, this is uh, talk number two uh, focused on turkeys. We're leading this avian archaeology uh, series off with one, two, and three on, on turkeys. And as Linda said, uh, Bill Light and Mary Wiaki um, will be our, our speakers next on December 7th. And it will be turkey feather blankets in ancestral Pueblo history. And I think it would be so wonderful if we could get the tactile aspect of a turkey feather blanket through uh, to all of you who will join us over Zoom. But I think that's not quite yet accomplished by the technology. So. Um, Bill and Mary will have a wonderful talk for you and uh, enjoy your Thanksgiving yeah. turkeys. And, and thank you, Sean. What, what a great, great presentation that it's clear you have been, you have had experience teaching because it was all very clear and easy to understand. So, well, I think all these folks who are engaged in this avian archaeology uh, theme are come in with like maximized levels of enthusiasm. So keep coming. Uh, thanks, Sean, for sharing your enthusiasm and knowledge, and uh, we look forward for a whole another uh, raft of these things coming forward. Thanks again. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye.